Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 11. I think it's a good chapter to go to in the time we're in. I said, I think this is a good chapter to go to in the time we're in. Okay, three of you. Maybe four. I counted Bill twice. It resonated. It came bouncing. Okay. You're right. Actually, let's back up in the chapter 10. Let's start around verse 35. It says, uh, verse 32. Call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly while you were made a gazing stock, by, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of you. This is, a, this is almost an internal thing that it's Paul. Okay? It would be either Paul or Peter, and Paul, Peter didn't want this smart. Paul wrote with eloquence. Okay, he was very educated. Peter was a fisherman. Remember, they took note of them. They were ignorant and unlearned men, but they had been with Jesus. Okay, so they preached with authority and power, but they were ignorant and unlearned. Paul was not ignorant nor unlearned. Okay, uh, but while he was in his bonds, took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For a little while, and he that shall come will come, and he will not tarry. It kind of makes you think of the other uh, Sunday we're talking about, you know, though it tarry, wait for it, it will not tarry. Remember that? It won't be held back. God's promises won't be held back in a, in, in a way with no hope. You're gonna, he's going to bring his promises to pass. Now, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believing, believe to the saving of the soul. Now, faith is. Now, I know we've, got, we've had a billion sermons on now faith. And, and yes, it is present tense because the word, verb uh, is is present tense. Um, but it is a transitional word, okay? It's, it's, not, it's not, you know, now faith, now faith, now faith, or it's not an adjective, so to speak. It's a transition, Okay. Um, you know, we get cute sometimes, and, I, and I've preached it, I've done it, but in reality, we don't have to be cute, we just need to be accurate, okay? So, the transition is, now faith is, faith is, so faith is present tense, okay? That makes it present tense. Are y'all here? Did I just miss somebody's favorite sermon by somebody? Okay. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. One translation said the title deed. Another says the guarantee. Uh, another says the assurance. There's different translations that, that all try to bring to pass the same thought. That your faith is what tells you or guarantees you <clears throat> or um, assures you that what you're hoping for you have. Not with seeing it, not having it in your hand, not possessing it. Your faith is. Your faith is the title deed. Now, how many know when you get a property or you get uh, an automobile, you possess something, and you, you own it outright, the bank doesn't have a lien against it, because if the bank has it, they got the, t they got the deed to it. They got the title for the car, and you got the deed of the land. Okay? And then when it gets free and clear, you get it. It's signed over to you. Everybody say Glory. It's always good when it gets signed over to you, isn't it? Isn't it? And so faith is the title or the deed of things hoped for. In other words, you may be hoping for something, but it is faith that guarantees you you have it. You can hope for it and not have it. You have to move into the arena of faith to have it. And so, and this is the evidence of things not seen. So you may, um, now I could, I could pull out a, a deed to a piece of property in California, never been there. I could. 
I, I could have a piece of property in California. I bought have the title deed to it, the deed to it. And, and somebody say, you got property in California? Yep. You ever seen it? Nope. How do you know you got it? Deed. Tells me where it is. Tells me who it's reg where it's registered. Tells me who it belongs to. It's mine. Sealed. It's mine. I can go out, fly out there, walk up there, and somebody say, I ain't never seen you before. Get off this land. And you say, it's my land. How, why, what do you mean it's your land? It's my land. Oh, there's the deed. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what they believe. It doesn't matter if they don't like you. If you have the deed to it, it's yours. Somebody say, Glorioski. Be a little Polish tonight, Glorioski. Or if we, say, if we end it with a Y, it's Russian. Okay, Glorioski. Uh, anyway, thank you for your enthusiasm. For by it, that is thy by faith, the elders obtained a good report. Now, how many want to obtain a good report? Now, anybody can have a bad report. We want a good report, don't we? Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, let me tell you something. You, you wonder why people all believe in, in evolution and, and, and believe in the Big Bang Theory and they believe in all these crazy things. You know, I mean, I'm telling you, um, you know, in, in a human, humanistic mindset, that's, they, they got great faith. But they don't have Bible faith. They have to see something. They have to control it. They have to have it in possession to, act, to believe. And they really don't believe it. It's just because they can see it and touch it. They, they accept this reality. And see, they can't put God to test too, so they don't accept God. They, they, it doesn't make sense to them that a, a being they don't believe exists created everything. That makes a whole lot more sense than a bunch of cosmic gases floating around there, exploding in every direction, and then swirling around over enough, enough years that um, it, it formed a planet, and it was the right distance from a sun with the water and the oxygen levels at the right thing. That, and then there was some kind of electrostatic charge that went off in the atmosphere that took a bunch of junk and made it into life. And out of that single, that, not even amoeba, just that single, single cell, uh, life form, everything else evolved. Like that guy, it's kind of like that guy on that, on the, you on Facebook, that, that, that uh, cowboy. He said, you believe that? You're a special kind of stupid. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, uh, and they think we're crazy because we believe a, 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 a being created all of this. And they think we're stupid. Or have faith in, you know, a, 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 um, an unrealistic belief system. Again, special kind. Okay. Now, just tease it. Don't get upset with me out there. I'm just, I'm picking. But, you know, you call us stupid, so we just, you're special. Special kind. Anyway. So, we believe that the things which are seen were not made of things which appear. Because God created it. God spoke it into existence. Now, quite frankly, I, I kind of, in, in a, uh, I guess, sarcastic or mocking way, say that I believe in the Big Bang Theory. Because I believe God said, boom, and it happened. Because God spoke it into existence. It did. The universe is expanding in every direction at the speed of light from a single point. It was God's mouth. God said, light be, light was. Actually, you know, the King James says, let there be light. The Hebrew says, God said, light be, light was. Now, God don't mince words. Hallelujah. So, <clears throat> faith offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and that by it he being yet dead, yet speaketh. See, faith is an eternal substance. Your faith will uh, succeed you. It will go on after you. You can leave faith in the earth. and it's, um, I'm trying to remember the great evangelist. That, I'm not sure if it was Charles Finney, uh, or, but one of the major uh, revivalists from the late 1800s or so, um, had prayed for a friend. He had prayed for this friend his whole life. Guy never got saved. He prayed for him right up to the day he died, and the guy didn't get saved. 
except at his funeral he came and got saved. His faith, his faith kept speaking even after he died. And brought to Pastor Sunday, shared Sunday about the, the land that, and, told, and, and broken air for Ramah. That, they, that man prayed. His faith, his faith kept speaking even after he died. Why? Because faith is words released into the atmosphere and they're at work. And they were spoken in faith and not recalled and not, and not uh, like Charles Capps used to say, you know, you didn't pray for it, you didn't speak and have a crop failure. Uh, but you put it out, you know, sometimes we need to pray about having a crop failure because you've got so much bad seed in the ground. Just, you know, Lord, let's, let's, let's have a crop, crop failure out there. And, um, but your faith will continue to go forth even after death. Why do you think that when the, the, the uh, Old Testament saints would call the kids and they'd lay hands on them and speak over them? Some cases they would curse them. They'd say, you haven't been living right. You're, this is going to happen to you. Others would say, bless them. They, they left their faith on their lives of what was going to happen. Praise God. So our faith is not just a moment. So we use it so much for momentary things. We're so desperate to have an answer right now, this very moment. And we, we forget the eternity of God, the eternity of faith, the eternity of words released and spoken in faith. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. God spoke to the serpent in the garden and said that the seed of the woman would bruise his head. Now, that, that was a Western, or I mean, an Eastern term, an Oriental term. And that term... Uh, bruise your head literally meant break your authority in Eastern languages, translated back into English, obviously. But in, in the context of the way that, that structure of that language is, that, word, that phrase, you know, he shall bruise, the seed of this woman shall bruise your head. He'll break your authority. Now, it was a, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 4,000 years before that came to pass. But see, God's not moved by time. God's not moved by the fact that he spoke a word and it didn't happen right away. That's us. You know? And we can move out of this building and you'll, have, you'll be some people saying, oh, that happened over there. I thought they were a faith church. We are a faith church. We're going to the place God's going to show us. Amen. I really don't care what the naysayers have to say. Now, that's naysaying. I really, you know, you know if, you, if, you, if you just don't want us to succeed, just... Go talk over somebody else and leave us alone. We're going, to have, God's, we're going to follow God. God's going to lead us. Well, if, if it was God, he would, you would already know where to go. What Bible do you read? Hello? Please tell me what Bible you read. Because I, I, I got one. That ain't how it works. As a matter of fact, there are times in the Bible they were about doing stuff for the Lord in the New Testament, out walking and carrying out and doing for Jesus, and the Lord had to stop them. Don't go over there. And they got thrown in jail and whipped. Come over unto us. Think about it now. If you had some of the people backing them up to then that you have backing people up today, they'd all be in trouble. Yeah, he was, just, he was going to go over, and the Lord said, don't go over there. Didn't tell him where to go right then. Stopped him. He was, he was, the Spirit of God stopped him. Then, then he said, come, he had a vision, said, come over into Macedonia, went over there, and they got thrown in jail and whipped. Now, can't you imagine Barnabas' first words? Paul. Yeah, Barnabas. You know the night you had that vision? Yep. Was it Little Caesars or Papa John's you had? Or both? Because I think you had too much pizza. Because that's one of them pizza dreams, indigestion dreams. Because if it was God, we wouldn't be over here in jail with our backs but beat. Except they experienced a miracle where the jail cells were busted open. The jailer came in, get ready to kill himself. Paul got him saved. That whole jailer's uh, whole household got saved. And theologically or, or historically in the church, believed he became the first pastor of that church in Ephesus. And, and that became the uh, base of Paul's ministry in that region was Ephesus. 
He moved in and out of Ephesus. Yeah. But some people think, if it was the Lord, you wouldn't have got thrown in jail. I'm telling you, if you're going to walk, Brother Hagin, if you're going to walk by faith, you're going to encounter some difficult places. Some folks believe they're going through life on flowery beds of ease. And then I added to it, singing tiptoe through the tulips with Tiny Tim from Miss Vicky. That was, although that was a redo of an older kind of a country song or a real country song that was done in the 30s. Tiny Tim updated it, if you can call it that. Hallelujah. Now, walking by faith does not mean it's all good. It's all hunkadory. Walking by faith is I'm following God no matter what's going on. I'm going to encounter stuff. You read Paul's life over there in, um, uh, it's either 1st or 2nd Corinthians uh, 11. I believe it is. Let me, I better go find out if I'm in the right place. Hallelujah. No, it's not first. I have this, you know, sometimes I just kind of see this in my head. And um, there we go. Um, First, Second Corinthians 11, where he talks about in journeyings often and, fa and fastings often and prisons uh, uh, abundant, uh, uh, more frequent and deaths often. Uh, the Jews five times received I have 40 stripes, save one, that's 39 five times. Um, thrice I was beaten with rods, once I was stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck. Ooh, if he was fallen Lord, none of that would have happened, would it? Do you remember when Paul, uh, when, when the Lord appeared to Ananias and said, go into uh, one place and find Simon, um, uh, uh, someone named Simon, street called Straight, and find one Simon, a, a, a um, what's that? Tanner. Tanner, that's, I, Tanner. and, and, and um, go in and, and you'll find uh, Saul. And behold, he prayeth. And, um, and, and uh, Ananias said, now, Lord, I've heard of him. <laughs> How he's, uh, you know, caught people and put them in jail. And are y'all trying to use it? Okay, okay I thought y'all running the scriptures up on the screen for me. Um, you know, uh, and we've heard of him. How he's persecuted the church, put people in jail, all this kind of stuff. And the Lord said, you go. For he's a chosen vessel unto me, and I will show him much what, what things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul knew he was going to, have to go through some stuff. Even that, he got to the point, he said, Lord, I, I, I beseech you three times. He besought the Lord to get rid of it because he was tired of dealing with it. Now, I'm not advocating that, you know, we, we're supposed to suffer like everything. And it's the only way we're going to grow. I'm just telling you, if you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to encounter the devil. You're going to encounter persecutions. You're going to encounter him coming against you. You're going to encounter him using people against you. Hello. And it's not always going to... It doesn't take any effort to live by faith if everything's wonderful. Hello? What do you do when it's not great? What do you do when the tests and the trials of life come? What do you do when the pressure from the enemy comes? The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at uh, Ephesus and said that to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Amen. Amen. And then when you've done everything you know to stand, he says, stand therefore. Philip's, old Philip's translation said, stand on the battlefield ready to do battle again. Hallelujah. See, we have to stay ready. We have to fight the good fight of faith. It's, it's a fight. I know the teaching grace now that everything's hunkadory, you know, you just, you just kind of breeze through life. <laughs> You're a special kind of spiritual stupid. Because you're going to get your feet put up where your head was two seconds before at some point in time in life. And you're going to be going crying to people about. And what they'll tell you is you don't have enough revelation on grace. No, they didn't prepare you. Paul said put on the armor of God so that you can stand. He said there's going to be an evil day that comes. And you need to be equipped to stand when it shows up. And then Paul talks about all things he went through. But he stood. Amen. But we try to tell people that they're not going to have any problems. You're not going to encounter anything. You're just going to run through life and, you know, because you're under grace, the blessings of God are just going to fall. You don't have to tithe. You don't have to give. You don't have to go to church. You don't have to submit. don't have to obey. don't have to testify. don't have to, don't have to do anything. It's just going to happen. 
And then, it, then at some point in time, it doesn't happen. And they're left looking around, wondering what's wrong with them. And what usually happens is they'll turn their back either on God or on the church or on uh, that teaching and become extremely the opposite direction. And you've done them a great disservice because grace is powerful and grace is beautiful. And grace is a, 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 the or one, at least one of the major central themes of the New Testament. Absolutely. But it is biblical grace, not Looney Tune grace. And when we teach people that you don't have to fight the fight of faith. Well, if you've entered into faith, you've entered into rest. Read your whole Bible. What have we entered into rest from? Our ability to make it happen. Not that we don't pray, not that we don't seek the Lord, not that we don't stand our ground in faith and take our authority. Not that, you know, no, we don't, we don't go out, you know, I believe in God for prosperity and you're working six jobs to get that car. That's your labors. I don't care, you know, uh, you know. Now on the other side of it, you don't just lay down and believe the car's going to show up. There's, there's, there's balance, and that's not compromise, there's biblical balance. You tithe, you give, you serve the Lord, you, you keep your faith out there, but you do go to work, you do earn money. Um, you can't tithe and give if you don't have anything. Okay? But you just don't lay down and start, you know, and really manipulate other people to do it for you. I'm under grace. Yeah, brother. Now, this, uh, this used to happen when I was in Bible school. Somebody found out somebody got blessed. So they got a financial blessing. They had some money come in. They're excited about it. They've told a couple people. Yeah, praise God, you know, I just had a, had a uh, somebody just sent me $10,000, and all of a sudden that person shows up. Yeah, praise God. We're so excited for you. I want you to know something, though. We are believing God, too. We have a $5,000 need, and we're believing God. Just like you, we're expecting God to move. And all of a sudden, that person goes home. The Lord told me to give you $5,000. Oh, no, people, yeah, that's, that was faith. No, that was manipulation. Now, I remember a number of years ago, my roommate, before he was my roommate at Ramo. We had, we, had, we had started, when I first got saved, I was just crazy for Jesus. I just wanted to be around people who love the Lord. And we had this prayer meeting thing going on. The pastor wasn't too happy about it. I didn't know that. I was too young. I was just too young and dumb. He's a good man. He loved us. Um, and he keeps put with us on Facebook. He married me and Janie. And, you know, I grew up. I got, I got, but I was really young. And um, <clears throat> so I didn't know anything about faith. I just knew I loved the Lord. I didn't know what faith was. Now I was copying people, but I didn't know what it was. And um, so we're over there. We get ready to have the prayer meeting in about an hour. We all got there a little early and we we're kind of sitting around. And, and uh, George comes out. And then you got to understand this is 79. So he comes out with a auto reverse cassette player, AM, FM radio, weather band with one big speaker in it. That ain't stereo. And it's not a big, it's not, no, it's not the big, it's just, it's about this big. So it's a, it's a mini box, mini boom box. And, uh, and he's so excited. He can put his teacher tapes in there and listen to them. They auto reverse and all this kind of stuff. I mean, he's just so excited. Well, the other guy sitting there, just kind of sitting there. He, he thought, he, he about as narcissistic of a Christian as I've ever met. Well, you never, you know, Brother George, you never know. God just might tell you to give me that. <laughs> Come back the next week. We're all kind of getting ready for the meeting. He comes walking out like he's got the Holy Grail. The Lord spoke to me and told me to give it to you. Uh-huh. Lord of the flies. Beelzebub. God did not tell him to give. He was manipulated into that by that, that suggestion. The Lord might tell you to give it to me. If he wanted one, you know what he should have done? Gone home, got in his prayer closet, said, Lord, that, that, that's a really nice thing. And I would enjoy having one too. And, uh, and, and I, would, I would like to receive one of those. I, I'm just going to put my faith and believe I receive it. Between you and you don't have to tell George to give you his. This is what he did. The Lord might tell you. Mm-hmm. 
Now, I know what Melody would tell him, but, that, you know, she could tell my wife. Miss Janey, Pastor Ed said, said she will tell her. She if you look on my back, I got tire marks from the bus on it. She put me under the bus and drove on top of me and sat it there. I'm Melanie, I'm just picking on you now. What's that, what's that Jeff? Overnight? See, faith, faith is able to go and appropriate the promises of God and receive, and you don't have to manipulate everybody else into giving it to you. They, 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 I, I found out, I found out that the people who had to have a bill paid on Friday and people who had to have a bill paid on Saturday, they weren't dropping the hints to the guy whose bills were due on Friday. He didn't have the money. They weren't going to them and saying, yeah, brother, I'm, I'm with you. I'm just like you. I got, I got money due on Saturday, but we're standing with you on Friday. They weren't talking to them. It's the people who got the money. The year before I went to Rama, the uh, uh, alumni director at the time, when I first started Rama, he was an instructor there. He's also the alumni director. said uh, he got up to rebuke students for the, for the ever, before they ever did it. He said last year we had, a, we had an elderly couple come here. Had taken all their retirement to come to Rama. Everything they had to their name, they they bought so they could go to, they're 70 years old, they want to follow God, they want to, they, so they're coming to Raymond to go to Bible school. And some little leech got a hold of them and blood sucked them to by the end of the year they had nothing. And then he's going to get up at the end of the year and testify how the Lord took care of him. <laughs> and somebody had the brass to stand up and tell them they were a liar that they had blood sucked that right out of publicly blood sucked that couple dry that year by manipulating them yeah see on one side you got people who have such a good heart and want to do things and want to follow God and want to do right and want to follow the Holy Ghost if the people are the ones getting you to give it to them, it ain't the Holy Ghost. Now, it's different if I say, Jeff, come here, brother. You got a need, yeah. I say, Jeff, Jeff has a need. He needs 50 bucks on Saturday. Anybody here want to give that or the Lord speak to you? You, you know, and we just, here, here's a need. If you want to give in on that, fine. You say, Pastor, I want to help there. You know, you can you go this. I don't even know God's telling me to. But I just went out of compassion to be a blessing. That's one thing. But, you know, Jeff won the lottery. $50,000. Brother Jeff, the church, after your tithe on that of five, the church has about $45,000 we need. You just be obedient. God may have won, given you that money so you could give it to the church. Here he comes. Oh, I had a counter with God. And then Melanie coming right behind him. You get that money out, you, you won't walk out of here alive. Neither will the pastor. Now, that's different if he wins that and he looks at his wife and goes, you know what? You know what? That's God's money. It's not ours. And we're going to obey God. That's a whole different scenario. That's walking by faith and not by sight. But when you start getting manipulated, it's okay for the church to say we have need. It's okay for people. Somebody says, how are you doing? Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I've been struggling. Can you agree with me? You know, I don't, I'm not asking you to give me money, but agree with me. We, need, we have a financial need. Okay? But I want you to agree with me and believe God with us, you know? How much? Well, you, you know, look, I'm, I'm not telling you because I want you to give me. I'm just letting you know. We need, we, you know. And you didn't approach him. You don't, you know, you don't go start it. If I walk up to Melanie and say, Melanie, how are you doing? She says, Pastor, we're struggling. We're in a tight spot. I mean, it's, it's been tough. Well, I agree with you. Amen. Now, God's led me to take up offerings to people. He's, he's led me not to take up offerings. I always want to. Why? 
because I love people. And I don't want to see anybody hurting. But I don't want to be an instrument of hurting their faith either. And I've had to learn over the years, I've got to follow God in those things. My heart says, let's do it. Sometimes God says no. Why? Because they need to learn to live by faith and not by the, by, by the church. He wants to do something in them that'll, that'll take them the rest of their life instead of get them through this moment. So we have to, we have to, pastors have to be led by the Holy Ghost. You got to be led by the Holy Ghost. Listen to your spirit. Hello. Now I've given people money. Hey, you know, we've, we've taken up offers for people over the years. I mean, they were in, they were in dire situations. And we've had people come in and just uh, be here two or three weeks and the Lord speak to say, take up an offering. Then one time we had somebody in the church got into us, you know, through, through different decisions and, and paths they were taking. They got to where they had nothing. They were just about broke. I mean, when I'm talking broke, they had some change in their purse. That was it. I mean, I walked out of the room over here, walked on the platform, looked at, it, at the wife, and I thought, my God, looks like a pig pen in his blanket over there. I'm talking about a cloud. Just dark, just drear, just defeated. And I just said, Lord, I'm going to take up an offering. I did. Well, I'm, I'm, ta- I'm going to take up an offering for them. Now, they were leaving the church. They were moving to another city. They were going to start a church. And, and you know, didn't want to be affiliated with us in the sense of being a sister church or whatever. And I'm, I'm going to take up an offering for them because I want to bless them. I love them. Don't want them hurt. Don't want them hurting. I've never had this happen like that before. But I'm, I'm sitting on the platform right over there in that corner. I said, I'm going to take up an offering for him. The Lord said, no! I'm like, whoa. <laughs> that kind of messed me up. Because he, he was strong. Probably, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know if I've ever had that experience before or since. That strong with God telling me something. To do or not to do. And so we can only went through worship and that kind of stuff. And, um, and I'm sitting there, I'm struggling. I'm like, Lord, well, why? I'm kind of like, Lord, why not? I mean, you know, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with the decision they made, but they've been faithful, they've served, they've been a blessing. You know? Um, they'll, they'll figure out in, in time if it's the right or wrong decision, but, you know, I want to help them. He wouldn't even talk to me about it because he already told me. Now, when the Lord tells you something and you go talk to him about it and he won't talk to you about it, shut up. There ain't no need. He's like that. He, you know, he, he's funny like that. When he says, he means what he says, it says what he means. And uh, so we're going on through the service. You know, it's, it, we're moving along. And we get to the offering. And I said, well, it's time to receive the offering. We start taking up the offering. And the wife reached in her purse and pulled out probably 35 or 40 cent and put it in the offering bucket when the offering went by. And when it, as soon as she did, it went by, he said, now you can. See, what I was going to come out and do, I was going to come out and stop the service and do it. But when they put the last they had into the offering, he said, Now. See, it had to be done in his principles and not just out of my want to. Not that compassion is not a good thing, but they had a lesson to learn for themselves that will carry them further in life than my move of compassion would have at that moment. We still got to have the compassion, but it had to be done on his terms because he wanted a life lesson taught. And so... Offering got taken up. I said, and I can't, and I'd have people come to church come to me. They're not supposed to leave. They're not supposed to move. They're not supposed to do that. Look, guys, whether I agree with it or not, it's irrelevant. They want to do this. They believe God's telling them to do it. 
God will bless them because they're, they're, because they have a good heart, you know, and He can correct it in, in in the right time. You know, God God can do it. So we're just going to let you know, just just leave it alone. And uh, that's, that's so I started talking. I said, "Listen, I, I was a real I was real open." When you got a church family, everybody's talking about it, you may as well not try to act like it's not happening. I said, listen, guys, now you know that the so-and-sos are planning on leaving and moving to this particular city in this other state. And you know, a lot of you are thinking they shouldn't be doing that, and that's not the right decision. I said, but that's irrelevant. I said, this morning there's a need. And I said, we're going to minister to that need. And it's not a matter of who's right or wrong, whether it's right. It's what God wants us to do. One person gave their whole paycheck for the week. I believe somewhere in the neighborhood of $3,000 to $3,800, we had 80 people in the room that morning. We put into their hands. Not because we wanted to stop, not because we were trying to manipulate just because out of, the, out of following the voice of God. But before, and, and let me say this, I also believe had I done it, it wouldn't have been that kind of offering. It had to be on God's terms of faith. There's times that compassion just comes in when people are unlearned and ignorant, and, and sometimes we're in, we're in pivotal points in our walk with the Lord that things have to be done a certain way so that we learn the right lesson going forward because there's bigger things in front of us that we can't miss. And so that day, and, and, and the husband had come to me the night before. Because we came back, we were on vacation, we came back in town, he'd come to me and said, I've got to talk to you. Later, I quit their jobs. All right, packing up, getting, I mean, looking for places to move to in this other town, about, about five, six hours away. And we met up in the front up there, up there, sat down and, talked and I just looked at him and I said listen and I meant this with everything I had in me Israel wanted a king and God gave him a king and from that point on the king was God's will he anointed him he appointed him I said so even if you guys aren't doing the making the right move here God will bless you God will direct you he went home, he said, came, he came back the next day, and, and, and during this service, he said, after the offering, he went up and took the microphone and said, I wrestled all night long with those words. He said, I don't want a king. I want to obey God. And the wife had prayed so much about this move that anybody's counsel that came to her that was contrary to it, she couldn't receive because she had prayed it out so much. So you can pray yourself right out of the will of God. I'm not saying this to make anybody look bad. I'm telling you this so you can understand. God has ways of doing things that we can't do. She said, but it broke when y'all took up the offering. The money, it broke it. It broke that. Because the husband got up when he came, started to come up and said, you know we're not moving, don't you? And she wasn't ready to let go of it still. But, but the offering broke it. See, God needed an act of faith to do the other things he wanted to do. And when the wife took the change out of her purse and put it into the offering bucket, that's all she had. It was a, what she has, wasn't even enough to buy her, her a bottle of formula for the baby, which she needed to feed when they got out of church. That's why God told me no. Because what he wanted to do required faith to do all he's done. He did. And God turned that whole thing around. Blessed them. That money lasted them. Uh, they had been on staff. We, you know, we kind of really, really agreed that it wasn't, you don't need to come back on staff right now, at least at this point. And they never did full-time come back on paid staff. Um, that lasted them until he started the business, and that business has grown and flourished and grown and flourished and just really grown. And I believe that business grew out of that seed 
in that offering. But they're not here anymore. Oh, so what? I mean, there's people I like to have here, but you know what? They may, they, they've gone different places or different ways. That's irrelevant. The fact is that we followed God. They acted in faith. And the point is that an act of faith brought this on their life. And turn things around. I mean just turn things around. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's why we, and I kind of got off on this track because we can't try to do what the Lord wants to do just because we think it's a good thing to do. That's why you need to check with the Lord. Or when he hollers, no, listen. No! Are you sure? I'm, not, I'm just sitting on the platform having a conversation. I don't know what song they sang. I don't know how many times they did it. You know, a lot of charismatic courses are called the 7-Eleven. Seven words 11 times. That's what the liturgical people call our, our worships. So it's the, oh, it's one of them 7-Eleven churches. You sing seven words 11 times. That's okay. When I need to get healed, I know what to say. I can run through a troop and leap over a wall. Hallelujah. I know liturgical songs have great music theory, but sometimes you need something with faith, not liturgical theory. Or, 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 or not, I'm sorry, not liturgical theory. Music theory in liturgy. Okay? Sometimes you need something that's got faith in it. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I'm going to have to unhook and stop here. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.